Hello everybody. Welcome to Conversations. I'm Charlie Newton and today we have a special guest with us, Ms. Mrs. Adira Causey, who is the curator of education. And I was thinking you was like the president of education. <laughs> I don't know the titles, but yeah. Adira, we're so glad to have you here with us today. I just wanted to introduce you to our community and uh, just just have a conversation with you. How are you doing today? Wonderful. I'm doing great. It's a sunny day. It feels like fall and we're here surrounded by beautiful things. Oh, so good. Yes, great. we are. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. so much. So glad that you could join us today. So we just want to have a conversation. So we're going to start off with who is Adira Causey? Where are you from? <laughs> Where am I from? Well, <laughs> I was born in Baltimore, actually. The same hospital as, I don't know if you know Monica Ellison, who's a great dancer in town. She's married to Cherokee. And um, so she's the only person I know who was born in the hospital where I was, oh, okay. in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. And then mostly lived in D.C., so kind of Baltimore wow. and D.C. most of my life. And then and did some of my schooling there. And then ultimately came down to North Carolina for grad school and made my well way farther south and I guess west and landed here almost 19 years ago. Well, one of the things we want to do is encourage, especially our kids, but encourage people that it doesn't matter where you're from. No, it does not at you know, all. Yeah, it matters who you are and where you're going. And that's why we want to meet, have some authentic conversations, which sometimes it's hard to do you know, in our world, especially in the, well, I'm in the ministry world. Believe it or not, it's, it's hard to do that in the ministry world. It's hard to do in the art world. It's hard to do, you know, but there are so many conversations that I have with people just one-on-one, -on -one, you know, friends and people on the street and, and what have you. And I think that one major issue, this is just me, I think one of the major issues in Chattanooga is the lack of communication. People just don't talk. And I think that when we talk, we figure out that we're all the same, really. No, we so, are. So, what high school did you go to? Ultimately, well, a few different ones, but they were all in D.C. and, okay. like, Maryland, right outside right. of D.C. Now, D.C. is my favorite city, by the really? way. Really? Yes. I've visited D.C. more than any other city in the world. So, I really love D.C. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's an interesting hometown to have, but it is a great I guess place. It is. Yeah. Well, every, everybody comes, the world comes to D.C. It, it, yes, it does, <laughs> and then leaves every four right, years. <laughs> right, the world comes and leaves. That is correct. The seat of power is in yeah. Washington, D.C. So what is what was it like living in a place like that where there's so uh, many politicians, so much uh, power? What, what's the energy? You know, it's funny because there's the D.C. that you see on TV or the D.C. that does have the power. And then there's the D.C. that's the people. And I think that's come more to the fore lately with people talking about giving D.C. voting rights and, right. and states' rights. So it's, it's kind of two separate worlds. And mm. a lot of those years were under Mayor Barry, right. who was, a, you know, an interesting character, but mm -hmm. actually brought to light that the people can have strength in themselves, which was an important contribution that often gets overshadowed by a few things he did that okay. he might not have should have done. Like, like uh, drugs. <laughs> drugs, <laughs> some personal choices outside of his marriage, things like that. But um, but he did, he did empower people to kind of create their own communities. And when the federal government is owning a lot of the land around you, so it's kind of that empowerment. And and I think that does come to bear here in Chattanooga, too, if you're living in Section 8 housing, if you're in a situation where you don't feel like you have as much control, which happens to a lot of communities, that there are ways to do it, but it's about believing yourself, trusting your neighbors, you know, creating your own micro-communities, which is sort of what D.C. is for the people who aren't moving in and out of every four But who years. creates those micro-communities, though? That's that's a hard one, right? Because there's always been this idea of there's still a, there's always a power structure everywhere, right, yeah. and so the who creates it? I mean, in D.C., it's kind of ignore the federal government and do your own thing because you can't wait for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then in other communities, I think it's people who believe. I mean, for me, I always think about people who believe in the next generation right, and right. are going to okay. invest 
in yeah. the next generation or invest in people who are the who have I mean to use your ministry example the least lost and the lost the people who have the least who have the least voice who have the least access to making sure that their voices are at the table because I think that's really where the seats of power are that's where the majority mm -hmm. actually lives and is and understanding who that is is how they get that the entire community can get engaged oh wow oh, that's powerful we're going to talk about <laughs> that a little bit more later. You got it. Uh, um, D.C., one of the reasons why I love D.C., I love going to the National Gallery. Of course. And there's some other, like, collections there. Mm -hmm. And I've been in a couple of collections there, but, as a matter of fact, but I really like the, uh, uh, I guess, the community, They're like communities like Adams Morgan yeah. and places like that. Just the, the I guess, the energy or the vibe there of the is. city. And I know there was like two cities. I, I first started going to D.C. In, in the mid 80s. Now during that time, it was the murder capital of the world. It was, and that was my teen years. Okay, <laughs> so, it shows yeah. how old I am. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so um, but but it yeah. absolutely was the murder capital of the world. But then you know you gave a great example. Adams Morgan now is is kind of touristy, but back then I if you were there. So. Yeah. yeah, it was, you know, block to block. And I remember mm -hmm. just you could go and get really inexpensive food from neighbors and people who were coming from all over. So right. they were they yeah. were coming in and out, but they were yes. people who were either due to being refugees or right. just finding a better life. Yes. So I remember there being this block of Senegalese. Yes. And a, I've spent a lot of time in that food. area. <laughs> Yes, very yes. good food. Yes. But um, I know I'm remembering these things based on food, but all right. of these Well, that's why we were there. <laughs> that's why we were there. That's why you were there, yeah. <laughs> right. But there were all of these small communities, and that's something that's hard that I think, you know, as we talk about gentrification later, which I think will probably come up, you know, locally, that that was a really hard thing to see in any city because you have these communities where people from other countries could thrive, people who might not be fortunate right. to have the background that some of the people coming into town did, mm -hmm. could thrive and could create their own economies, could create their own sense of yes. safety. Yes. So even though it was admittedly murder capital, um, it was, it was there was a way for it not to be. It wasn't mass senseless. I mean, mm -hmm. some of it was unfortunately due to some drug situations that were going on at the time, okay. as, as you probably remember. Yes. Um, but but it was also, you know, there were ways to be safe. There were ways to kids for kids to play in streets. Right. In right. places where you wouldn't expect it, right. where it doesn't happen as much. And that goes back mm -hmm. to, like you said, knowing your neighbors and yes. trusting your neighbors. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and kind of aunties on the corner looking out for the kids, right. regardless of if they were their own or right. not. Which was the community I grew up in, which is the West Side. I grew up here. Exactly. In the West Side where we are now. And uh, it's totally different now. And there's a lot of challenges coming in next year, actually. And um, so that is uh, interesting to know that D.C. Uh, sort of went or is going through some of the same challenges. Yeah. Just a little wanted. sooner. And because yes. it's bigger, it happened very quickly. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, w when did you get interested in art? Um, it's kind of funny because I actually, you know, I had really great teachers and support systems around me, and they said, you know, for you to make it a really great thing to do is to do math and science. You really love math and science, which I did. And as a female at a time where there were very few girls going into it, and really they were needing people in general because all of a sudden there was this thing called the computer, and you know, you know what years we're talking about. So I went and got a degree in engineering, and I actually did love it. And I, I still like how you said secret. that. You know, you said, I went and got like that was nothing. Well, <laughs> I just went and got a degree in engineering. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> No, well, it was, um, I mean, I loved math. I did. That's, that's I loved that you could kind of make things come out in the end, which wasn't always the case, you know, in right. the world around okay. us. Okay, um, okay. And, and it made sense to me. I could see numbers and they made sense. Wow. And so I did love it. And I was 
treated often these representations and I think for some young women going into the sciences at that time it was really hard I was fortunate and even in DC was it like everywhere that? I mean I okay. think you know it, it, you see these stories that come up about Nothing. women talking about it and I think I'm not at all saying their stories aren't real but right. I was fortunate that I had both male and female professors and colleagues who made sure that I had what I needed and felt supported you know even though the engineering building didn't have now, which, bathrooms. which college was this? <laughs> this was at Maryland, so oh, D.C. University Maryland of Maryland. Residence. Yeah, so we could all go there for free. I'm so jealous because I wanted to go there, but <laughs> well, then I also wanted to go to the Maryland Institute of Art. So oh, and that's I actually beautiful. got a, yeah, I actually got a, a scholarship to go there. To go to Micah, wow. I couldn't go because my father was sick, so I had to take oh, care I'm of him. sorry. Yeah, but um, yes, that's one of the, the you know things I look back on. Yeah. yeah, and Baltimore's a great town, too. Yes. I mean, you know, and it's got its own character, and it's mm -hmm. been able to maintain it in a lot of ways, okay. even though it's, as you know, struggled, and that's pretty much national news, too, right. for yeah. all kinds of reasons. But, yeah. um, but so Maryland at the time, and this is something that I also wish was still around, was college was more or less free. So mm. for us, so it wasn't, it wasn't a, can you afford it? It's, I mean, can you do it and still be able to support well, yourself? Why was it free? I mean, it wasn't free for me. I mean, what? <laughs> it just was. I was, I don't, I don't get it. Um, I, don't, I mean, the, I, I, the state had put money into kids from D.C. and Maryland. So there were a lot of D.C. and Baltimore kids there. Okay. So it was a surprisingly diverse school for a state school that mm. was not necessarily designated to be that. Okay. But oh, just looking wow. at the students who were feeding into it. So it was a really interesting support system. We strangely, not necessarily that today this is a claim to fame, my um, graduation speaker was Bill Cosby, <laughs> <laughs> which he had weird roots having to do with University of Maryland. Okay. This is before we knew about everything, obviously. Right, right, yes. Yeah, <laughs> when yeah. he was still getting on stage. Yes, he did a lot of just, great things in the community. He did, you know? he did. Yes. So, so he was a leader, you know, at right. that time. Right. And, and it kind of was indicative of what Maryland was, even though it wasn't this fabulous, well-known school. So I went there, and they had a really good engineering school. Now, I'm embarrassed to say, yes, I realized that Mr. Driscoll was there. I realized these great artists were there. I didn't actually know where the art building was. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> it was in my little corner of the campus, and yes. and I did have a good experience. You was with, using your uh, left brain at the time. Heavily, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it was, like I said, things work out in the end mm -hmm. with math. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I knew that there was a silver lining of I'd be able to get a steady paycheck and things that were going to matter. I mean, right, it was being right. practical. Right. And, and I did enjoy it and still do. But what it really came down to is, when, especially at that time, but still today in a lot of those jobs, you're working on one little piece of a puzzle in one little room with one little machine. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and I missed people. I miss having, you know, because I would have to go outside of my world to see people, mostly, mm -hmm. except for the few guys that I would work with, mostly, you know, male teams, who were also really supportive of me, but they were introverts, and I was not an introvert, so it wasn't a good personality match, which is a strange thing to say, and so I took a big leap and found out about grad schools, which at the time, because of the generation I was, there were all of these the millennials coming behind me because I was Gen X. So the millennials behind me needed TAs. So they were offering scholarships. I got very lucky through school wow. to, to go to grad school because they needed enough as going to grad school. So I literally got to grad school and I'd never had an art class, never had art history. And I remember the the person interviewing me looked at my GRE scores and they're like, we've never seen a perfect math score. And then they looked at the other side and they were like, did you take English? And I was like, in a high school. I took high school English. So my I hadn't had any, so I had to really learn to write beyond what our schools had, you know, in public high schools. And I had to learn to think critically and think more openly. And I, the very first picture I made, and I'm not an artist by far, but I think it's indicative of that travel, that, 
that voyage that I took was one side of it. I got help from another student because I couldn't actually draw what I was trying to do. But one side of it was like protractors flashing past and compasses and very linear and it was kind of grayer. And then as it went this way, it was flowers and kind of meandering paths. And that's how I saw that transition is that it allowed me to open up my world and to think things through with lots of colors instead of just black white gray wow and and so and it also allowed me to communicate with other people and kind of set my course and then um do you want me to keep going keep going so yeah so then um decided to get you know professors were like well you can keep going and get a phd because we need graduate students to become professors totally different economy than there is in this world today so then i went to unc chapel hill to do that and that was my first experience in the south and i was okay like, now yeah uh... Basket, great basketball yeah. team. <laughs> yes, and I was, but you know, I was an ACC girl back when these were all ACC schools, with the exception of Georgetown, which also counted as a very good school in terms of basketball, but was not ACC, but we still rooted for them. And then when I switched to Carolina, that was like the rival school to Maryland. So, oh, right. Know. That's right. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it was a problem, but I worked through it <laughs> <laughs> and got to, you know, go to grad school, which was just an incredibly intellectually enriching experience. And while I was there, once again, I had great colleagues, great professors. Carolina kind of soft walked me into the South because oh. it's it's still a, it's not quite as, and I don't want to call it a place more Southern than another, but it's a different place than here. It had more people coming from different parts of the world than you're going to see here. And um, It's not deep South. Yes. It's it about is 14 not deep hours south. from here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, and it was, it was a wonderful experience for me. <laughs> and then just started to realize, though, that by teaching in a college, I was only teaching kids who were had a level of privilege and life experience mm. and my first job was at duke both working in their museum and teaching their students and that was a whole level of privilege and what was you teaching at the time art history okay yeah and then museum classes and yeah kind did of you enjoy art history? i did well and that's what my degree was in and i okay. love art. well and it was kind of art history african-american studies so it was that intersection you play me and, you yeah Really? That's how I knew who was all teaching? This stuff. Who was teaching African American studies? Well, there? I mean, at, that was actually in the era when he was teaching more African American history. Art was Rick Powell, so I okay. had to study and work with Rick, who's just brilliant, as you know. And before that, Michael Harris, who just passed away, mm -hmm. and so who also was a part of Afro Cobra. So I was around okay. these incredibly vibrant people. I never knew that yeah. about you. Yeah. Wow. yeah, so that's where a lot. That's how I kind of know this background and that ba that's where my background is deeper. So if you ask me about the Renaissance, like Europe, I'm, I'm like, I don't remember. There's Michelangelo, a few other people. Well, we could talk about Wadsworth Gerald, who oh, is yeah. one of my mentors. <laughs> really? Yes, and Frank Smith. Yeah. Yes, yes. Because when I was traveling to D.C. in the 80s, you know, I'm meeting these guys. Yeah, and, and Sam Gilliam did a was there. Abroad. I met Wadsworth Gerald, and mm -hmm. it, in, uh, it, when did I first meet him? Uh, yeah, in London. I was his assistant. Wow. Actually, for a University of Georgia Studies Abroad program in Cortona, Italy. And so he had <laughs> me teaching all his classes. Of I know, I know. <laughs> you know he was, I was teaching all his classes for him while we was in Italy. So uh, we became really we're good friends to this day. Wow. And this happened in the 80s, so mid 80s. And this is when I met Iantha, my wife, I as well. I was wondering if yes. it was here or abroad where you It was abroad, met. yes. I mean, she wouldn't have come here on her own. <laughs> well, I didn't know I if there was some I, reason. I, tricked, I had to trick her <laughs> get her to come to Chattanooga. She actually came to, I was at um, Old Dominion uh -huh. and Norfolk State yeah. University in, in Norfolk, Virginia. So. You know, she came to Norfolk first. <laughs> so, wow, that so. must have been a big surprise. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend who grew up in kind of rural Australia of all places in Aboriginal communities and ended up meeting someone and moving to that area. And she convinced her husband to move after about a year. She was <laughs> like, I don't know where I landed. <laughs> <laughs> No, so 
oh, he yeah. found another job somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially going forwards, knowing that you have that. Yeah, so that's that ground, my grounding, that and it fit more also with kind of like how do I bridge this fancy art world that I'm studying in traditional art classes with this world that I grew up around and the richness of, you know, black communities and all of the cultural richness that was coming out of it, you know, growing up in a world of go-go, growing up in a world of mus of mm -hmm. murals. Right. And I mean, do you see a lot of great murals that aren't the official ones the government put up? Yes, yes. Which and so does Baltimore. Totally different. Mm -hmm. yes. And so does Baltimore. And, you know, and so, you know, street art was around and just artists are everywhere, right? right and right. so then getting to understand that lineage, sort of getting to understand that historical narrative, but then mm -hmm. also, and going way back, right? Because when you start with the diaspora and then you get to go right. into the richness of Afro-Cuban culture and Afro-Puerto Rican cultures yes. and all of these, and then, you know, you're going into Europe. So it's going everywhere, but yes. primarily in the U.S. That's where I'm a little more comfortable, right. you know, talking about, but... And then at Duke, you know, once again, had great students, but recognized that all of them had gone to museums all over the world that I'd never seen, and that there was nothing I was going to be able to give them that was going to be more than they could get just mm. based on the family into which they were born. Okay, okay, okay. And so, once again, I'm not saying anything negative about the people I was around, and I mean, Rick Powell is an amazing <coughs> man, and I'm Excuse fortunate mm -hmm. for that. But so that's what when I had the opportunity to transition to just full museum work, working in a community. And when Rob Kratt was looking for someone who wanted to change kind of what the hunter was at that time, with that famous Ruth Holmberg quote of get the hunter off the hill, and, and it's not just physical, not just adding that bridge, mm. but really doing something. And he took a chance on my saying, okay, how much change are you ready for? And and I'm not sure he knew exactly what that meant. <laughs> not sure I did until I stepped into Chattanooga and realized that there was a lot here and a lot here that needed support and a lot of stories that weren't being told when I was hearing two different stories about that bridge mm. that were coming from, you know, because Chattanooga was at that time in the early, you know, kind of 2003, celebrating the revived waterfront and the bridge, the largest walking bridge that we painted a bright blue to celebrate Chattanooga. There's a whole other story there yes. that was at the time. I mean, and you have this beautiful piece commemorating, you know, the, the real history of that bridge. But still with the blue, which is just really interesting, kind of combining the two. Right. right and right. and so kind of finding ways to not necessarily change the community because it didn't need changing, you know, but it did need opening up and a lot of bridges being built that weren't erasing anything. So have, have, we're going to... <laughs> Sorry, was that too we, much? No, I mean, it's a lot. Okay. <laughs> it's a lot. It's like, okay, okay. So I had no idea. You know, I no, had no idea that about your intentions and, uh, you know, your philosophy on life or because what happens is now the majority of people that I work with do not frequent the museum a lot. I know. And when they do, when like say we bring kids in, and sometimes parents, families, whatever, uh, they don't know who's running the museum. You know, it's almost like uh, another. It's, it is like another world. I spent a lot of my life in museums, <laughs> you know, in DC, right. and England, and Italy. You know, everywhere I go, that's where I go. I go to galleries and museums. You know because art happens to be my world. And so I know a lot of exceptionally talented kids and adults, uh, and not just in the community, but even incarcerated. Mm -hmm. I've seen some awesome talents that, you know, may not feel a part of the, how should I put it, uh, should I use the word dominant culture? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the non-global minority. Yeah. That, is that? <laughs> no, no, I, I sort of did a twist there, but, okay. <laughs> yeah, but that's I mean, I don't accurate. know what's. Yeah, yeah so. but the, the <clears throat> culture in power has created these hierarchies that shouldn't exist, that aren't 
accurate nor reflective. There seems to be a dichotomy, even when you go into a, a, a museum and see more representation. Agreed. But there's still the education piece <laughs> is not there. I think I don't believe it, it does appear to me to be. But I'm not an expert at that. You are. No, you're you're yeah. absolutely right, and it's hard because I think a lot of museums. When I first came in, there was this. They called it sort of the Jacob Lawrence exhibit theory. And Jacob Lawrence is an incredible artist. This isn't about him at all. But for a while, you sort of did checkbox, kind of like every right, high right. school does. Right. In February, we study Rosa Parks and right. Martin Luther King again right. and again right. and again. Right. 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 But we don't talk about the rich fabric of even that decade, let alone all the ones before and all the ones since. Right. Right. But um, the same thing happened with museums. They would have a Jacob Lawrence exhibit once every few years, say, well, we show African-American artists, and they would bring in docents from right. black communities right. to docent and would say but it's oh. they just chose not to stay with us and it's kind of like why? you have to build this right the why like did you have a relationship with them it's probably very obvious that you asked them to come in to do this one exhibit but you gave no reason to keep going and you didn't give connections and you didn't give them opportunities to speak their own voice not necessarily I mean yes with Jacob Lawrence you should absolutely tell about his life it's a fascinating life there is some information but there's also a lot more there and if you don't a lot allow more. yeah a whole lot more <laughs> and don't allow the color don't allow the nuances and don't allow Jacob Lawrence but also the lineage he created that's still seen in our communities today when kids are creating the world around them or creating the story of their grandparents I'll tell you heavy I'll tell you you're brilliant we're going to continue this because there's not many people that can shut me up but I was, I was listening to you I was like, okay she's I'm trying to calculate all this stuff that's coming. We got to talk about this more in part two. You got it.